I think we're working. <clears throat> Hi there, I am Drew Badger, the founder of EnglishAnyone.com and the English Fluency Guide. Welcome to another live video here on YouTube. Today we're going to talk about the fewest number of words you need to speak English fluently. All right, or, or to speak fluent English. Uh, I'll explain why I wrote it like that in just a moment. Uh, but make sure we're live over here. I think we should be going. Yep, we're all right. And if we have anybody in the chat, we'll see hopefully some people in here. Do like the video. Click on that like button right now. You know this is going to be a good video. I think we should be doing all right. <clears throat> all right, now we can erase this. I hope everyone is doing well out there. This should be an interesting video. Uh, it should be uh, exciting for people, hopefully, because you need a lot fewer words than you might think. Uh, actually, oh, it looks like chat is working now. Nice to see everybody out there. I'll keep my eye on the chat. Um, but yeah, let's begin. So I often uh, get asked this question from learners. Uh, they want to know how many words you need to speak fluently. I've seen quite a few answers to this on YouTube, but uh, nobody really just says the only answer that makes sense, which is one. Uh, and the truth is that you really only need to know as far as like being able to communicate something fluently, you become fluent in particular words or phrases. You don't get fluent in the whole language, you really get fluent in pieces of it. Uh, and, and we just kind of say that you get fluent in a language as you learn more and more of those pieces. <clears throat> but uh, you only need to know one word to speak fluent English because you can get fluent in that word, you can be fluent in this thing, but not fluent in this other word over here. So what I'd like to do in today's video is actually help people kind of redo, retrain their minds so they speak fluently. Uh, part of what you need to do to become a fluent speaker uh, is you have like vocabulary that you already know, and then you have new vocabulary that you're trying to learn. And so you take the vocabulary you already know, and there is probably, I don't know, let's just say, let's just say like this part of that vocabulary. Uh, so this is vocabulary you know, uh, and this is like unknown vocabulary over here. And so of the vocabulary you know, you have mostly like a passive vocabulary and then an active vocabulary. This is the vocabulary you feel confident about using. So again, you become fluent in individual words and phrases. So you only need to know one word. If you can say one word fluently, then you are fluent in that word. So fluency is not how many words you know, it's how well you know that vocabulary. So again, what I'd like to do is look at people's comments and I'd like you to type just a sentence uh, or something in the comments that you know, but you don't really feel confident using. And so I'd like to take that, I'll just look, often people will make um, kind of simple errors in the, like in the chat when they're writing or when they're speaking to one another. Uh, and so this means you, you probably have a passive vocabulary where you understand that, but you don't yet feel confident about that vocabulary. So you're not fluent in that vocabulary. You haven't gotten to what I call the ownership level of vocabulary. So you have a good awareness of it. You recognize the vocabulary when you hear it, but you're probably just not feeling very confident about it. So let's take a look at the chat. Uh, what I'd like you to do, uh, anybody, you can just, just post something in the chat, like a sentence or something that you feel. Uh, it could be a specific sentence or a grammar point or something like that, but just try writing the sentence out. Don't mention the name of the grammar point. I don't want you to think about present continuous or past perfect or whatever. Just think about uh, like trying to write a specific sentence, like something you'd like to say, but you don't feel very confident about using it. And so we'll look at maybe it could be one word or a few words, even just one word is okay. Uh, if you maybe heard that word, but don't feel very confident about using it. So what we'll do is get you fluent in more pieces of the language. So we start increasing this more and more. And so you really start feeling much more confident about expressing yourself. All right. So I'll go back uh, as people do that. I can give you some examples myself, but I thought it would be fun uh, just looking at the comments uh, people have over there. All right. Olympia says a high teacher, Paula. Hello from Brazil. Queen English says hello. Hello from Chile. Morning. 
<clears throat> hello from Algeria. Hi from the Philippines. More people from Brazil. Hi, teacher. Hello from Colombia. What? Chat disconnected. Oh, no. Are we out? What chat disconnected over here? Oh, no. It looks like my, maybe my, let me see here. Oh, no. That's going to be trouble <laughs> if the internet is not working over here. Let me see if I can do something about that. We are, we'll see if the chat is working. Make sure we're doing that. All right. All right, let me refresh this. Well, look at that. So you always have to improvise over here, make sure we're still, all right, still working. All right, but I think, let's see. So the chat is still working, we should be okay. All right, uh, so it looks like, yeah, the chat is working back and it should be okay. So yes, let me know like anything, it could be even just one word that you have trouble using or it could be a, a phrase or even a sentence, but something maybe lately you tried using it, uh, something you might feel comfortable lately, you tried using it, uh, something you might feel comfortable uh, uh, maybe writing, even if you make a mistake about it, but you would feel uncomfortable maybe writing, even if you make a mistake about it, but you would feel uncomfortable saying that word or phrase. All right, let's go back to the chat. All right, looks like we are still working back over here. All right, so nice to see people from all over the place. We got people from uh, Canada, Philippines. Hey, teacher Drew, good morning to you. Says Tom, nice to see you there. It looks like aesthetics life. I like that word, aesthetics, aesthetics. Good morning from Pakistan. Let's see, is that fried? Fried star, <laughs> it's a nice name. Uh, thanks for your terrific class, glad to hear. Alan Lee, I'm from the Philippines. You're my idol, Drew. Oh my goodness, no, don't make me an idol. Don't, don't need any more idols over here. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see, are you from California? No, I'm actually from Chicago, uh, asks uh, Fyodor. I think you were in the last video too, on, uh, what was that, Monday, I guess? Muriel Fallow from China, Blue Butterfly, I'm from Egypt, hello from Ontario. All right, so what happened? Okay, I think we should be working. Yeah, I think the video is working just fine now. But that was on. All right, looks like the chat is working. Sam says, hello, nice to see everybody there. Okay, Blue Butterfly says, I don't have one. Okay, why are you here? <laughs> That's really the better question for this video is, if you don't feel uh, I don't know, like a lack of confidence, or you feel confident using everything, then you shouldn't be watching any English language learning videos. You should be out speaking with people or just watching content for natives uh, because you understand everything. But I'm going to catch a few things in the comments, even if people don't have anything specific. I'm probably going to find some errors and maybe we will start there. I know everybody gets a little bit shy uh, when we're in kind of a classroom format like this, but this is for your own good. This is a four, a nice little phrase right here for you. So when you want to do something for someone else's benefit, even if they might not like it, you can say this is for your own good. And a simpler way to say this is just, I'm doing it for you. I'm doing this for you. It's for your own good, for your own good. All right, let's see what we got there. Eric is here. I've noticed that many of my classmates, myself included, have problems with the pronunciation of words like comfortable and automatically. Automatically, ooh, very good. All right, well, we can talk about pronunciation a little bit. Um, I'll just answer the questions about these. There are longer words like this, like comfortable, comfortable. So if we're going to count the syllable, the syllable is a sound in a word. So if we have like table has two syllables, table, table, that's the syllable. Uh, so comfortable, comfortable. You will hear that with four syllables pronounced, comfortable. Or you're here uh, like comfortable, comfortable. <laughs> it's like com comfortable, comfortable, like three sounds three syllables, comfortable. It really just depends on, uh, on who's speaking and how clear you're trying to be. So if you go to a really nice hotel, like let's say I travel to some four star, five star hotel somewhere, and they give me this really beautiful pillow and they say, Drew, this is really to make you feel very comfortable. So they're trying to really pronounce words very cleanly, clearly, enunciate well. So they're going to pronounce the whole thing. Uh, but if I go to a friend of mine's house 
And he's just like, have a seat, get comfortable. Have a seat, get comfortable. So he said, you know, sit down on the chair or something. So have a seat, get comfortable. So it, again, this is why it's so important to get naturally varied review when you learn. Because what usually uh, students are doing in a classroom is they will get a very slow, clear pronunciation of words. So if we have comfortable, So a word like comfortable, the teacher will pronounce it clearly comfortable, 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 okay? But in real life, you will hear it from many different people in different ways. Just like I gave in the example, the hotel says comfortable. Are you comfortable, sir? Are you comfortable? Or people will just pronounce it like comfortable. So it sounds more like com Comfort, let's say comfort, comfortable, comf comfortable. Are you comfortable, comfortable? So it's, it's, it really just depends on the situation. But that's again why it's important to hear lots of different people saying that same word, okay? So what was the other word you had? Automatically, uh, that's the same thing like, again, automatically, auto, so automatically, you might hear some people say auto, automatically, automatically, or you might hear ah, like auto, automatically, automatically, automatically. It just depends on who you're speaking with, and there's not like one correct way to pronounce it. It's just how people pronounce things in different situations. So you hear different things from different people. All right. Um, Let's see. But yes, if you'd like to hear uh, more, if you want to learn how to pronounce these things uh, step by step, you should get Frederick, which is in the description below this video. It's an app that will teach you how to make these sounds one at a time. And actually, you can learn to pronounce these things the same way natives do. So native children learn these sounds in a very specific order called phonics. So these are the rules of the sounds of English. Uh, and native children are learning the rules of those and also what words break those rules. So rather than starting at a word like comfortable, you start at a word like, I don't know, like, uh, like can, and then we move up to cane and then we move up to other things that get more difficult, longer words. But once you learn the pieces of them, it's much easier to put them together. And this is the same idea about fluency as well. So if you can't make fluent sentences, it's because you don't yet feel confident about particular words in those sentences, all right? All right, hopefully that makes sense. Um, let's see, all right, Olympia says, for me, two and four. Okay, so if you have trouble using even like simple words like two and four, it's much better to, to focus on a particular situation and then master each of the meanings for these words uh, by the situation, as an example. So we'll start with the word two. So if I'm going to, this is talking about like the direction for something. So we first want to just pick one situation and get lots of examples of that thing. So I am going to, and then what's the name of the place? Right now I'm going to the toilet. I'm going to Tokyo. I'm going to Brazil. I'm going to, uh, and then you can talk about like uh, whatever that physical location is. So this is again one example of the word to. You don't want to try to take a word and then we're gonna learn 10 different meanings of it. You want to master one situational use. So we learn words situationally the same way natives do. Remember that what happens with the native speaker, so native English children, will hear a word like to, and they will hear, oh, like go to. So let, I want to go to the park. I want to go to the toy store. I want to go to the party. I want to go to my friend's house. Okay, and then they will hear slight variations like I went to. So they feel more confident about, okay, we're gonna use go and the past tense of this is a little bit different. So to go to and went to someplace. But we're still really focusing on just one use for this word, okay? Now I might also, again, like as a child, I'm hearing this uh, a, like a slightly related 
usage of, usage of this is like go to, uh, going to eat. So I want to talk about like I'm doing something, like I'm still moving, I'm talking about the direction, like moving to something, uh, but for the purpose of that thing. So I'm going to eat at the restaurant. I'm going to play at the park. So I'm like moving in that direction so I can do that thing. Okay, does this make sense? So this is why when I talked about uh, like being able to use even one word fluently, uh, we're really talking about situations for those particular usage uh, usages. And we don't want to think about just the word to by itself because it's got many different meanings. And a native speaker, if you say, what does to mean? This is what they will tell you. This is how they will answer that question. They will say, oh, well, it depends on the situation. I can talk about to, like where I'm going. So I'm going to my friend's house. Or I can talk about a purpose, like I'm going uh, someplace else. I don't want to cover every usage of that. Uh, but the same thing with for. So for is another simple word, but it has many uses. And so I could talk about like, uh, like a present, which is like similar. We're talking about the direction of something like that. Like this train is for wherever. Or you might, you might also hear like this train is bound for. To be bad, be, yeah. Oh my goodness, B O U N D. To be bound for means we're going someplace. So that's the like the final location we're going to. So this train is bound for whatever. Or you might hear a train conductor or a bus driver say, like, this is just for whatever. So if we're talking about different trains, like the number two is for Texas, the number three is for Illinois, the number four is for California. So we can talk about the, like the purpose of it and the direction of that as well. But we're just focusing on one usage of that thing, okay? So we, we want to make sure that you, you don't try to think like a, like a language student. You should be thinking like a native. So this is the difference between learning English as a first language rather than learning it as a second language, okay? So when you learn as a first language, you focus on just one usage of it. Don't worry about the other ones. Just feel confident, okay, we're just looking at one thing and we, we will get used to that. We will feel confident about that and then we can learn others, okay? So that's how you do it. I don't want to spend too much time on one example, uh, but hopefully that makes sense. All right, hello from Panama. Let's see, I have difficulty in using in, into, and onto, says Tom. Okay, let's look at that. There we go. More good examples. And this is interesting because these are all, they're like short, basic words. So very common. Uh, but the interesting thing about fluency is that even a short or common word, if you don't feel confident about using it, then you can't use it fluently. So if we have in, let's see, we have in, into, uh, what was the other one like? On, on to, okay. Now from usually like native children when they're learning these things, they will learn just the physical motion idea first. And this is the same thing I do when I'm teaching phrasal verbs. So I want to show you physically how they work, like take off or put on just like a hat. So I put on a hat or take off a hat. So a child will like see something like a ball is inside a box. So you can say in or inside. And really this is just like, it's not moving. It's just a physical thing inside something else. So right now, like the tip of the marker is, it's in the cap, in the cap, all right? But in two is typically we're talking about motion of some kind, like I'm moving into. So I'm putting the, uh, the marker into the cap, into the cap, all right? And then onto is typically the same thing, but it's, it's, so it's motion, but on top of something. And it could be like on the top of it, or it could be on the side, like I'm putting the marker onto my face. It's like I'm putting the sunscreen onto my face. So remember that word we just talked about to by itself. And when you hear this, it's like, oh, like in, we've got a location. And two, we've got a direction. So we've got movement. It's like, oh, look at that. Like we're going to move in to something. Move into something. All right. To move into something or we're going to move onto something. 
So we're just talking about the direction of that thing and then where is it going, okay? But remember, the point is to look at something like this and then we learn just the beginning, uh, most kind of basic understanding of it in a physical way so we can understand it the same way a child does. Uh, because we might, uh, again, like take it to a more figurative meaning, like let me go deeper into this. So if I'm explaining something right now, I could go deeper into something. So I want to explain more. I'm going to explain more. I'm going to go deeper into a topic. So you can have a physical idea, like a hole in the ground. I'm digging a hole right now. Here's my shovel. And I'm digging down, digging, 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 digging. I'm going deeper into, all right, I'm going into the ground because I'm moving down in there, okay? But I can also go deeper into a topic. I could talk about it. So this is a physical meaning and this is a figurative meaning. It's the same basic idea, but this is how people learn like, oh, okay, I can use into when I'm talking about something physical, but I, I can also use it when I'm talking about something figurative, all right? So like I'm talking about going deeper into something or as I get deeper into my career. So as my career moves on, you notice I'm still talking about moosh, um, <laughs> let's see, uh, movement and motion at the same time. So I said motion. Uh, it's like a new word for you, but don't use that in your conversation. So I'm talking about movement still uh, as I go deeper, or as I get deeper into my career, or as we go deeper into this lesson or into the conversation, it's still talking about movement, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. And another thing I'll, I'll just add, uh, one last point about this, is that if you're ever, if you have like a, a longer sentence that you don't understand, always break it down into pieces. Hopefully we'll get some uh, examples of that. Uh, but you see we're just beginning with something very simple like this. And once you understand the simple words, then you can start combining them to make more fluent sentences. So you make fluent words. Words become fluent when you feel confident about using them. And then you start combining them together to start having fluent sentences. All right. Greetings from uh, Bolivia, from Panama. Nice to see more people from Brazil, from Ecuador. I think we have all of South America represented. All right, everyone tell your friends. Get on the chat and like the video. <laughs> all right, uh, let's see. More from Brazil. Heading to the supermarket for shopping. Very good. Aran was just using for. Like, we have a different usage of it. It's the same basic idea of, like, the purpose of something. All right, so we're going someplace to do something. All right, H. Ray says, I have trouble using how come. When is it not used properly? I could sound offensive, right? Mmm. Now, this is a great native expression. And I use this with my kids all the time. Uh, so typically a more, uh, and this isn't, why is not a formal word, but you will hear it more frequently, uh, especially when non-natives are speaking. So natives will often use how come. Uh, and how come by itself is not offensive. At least I've not like just seen the word by itself or these, uh, this phrase, how come. Uh, but typically, uh, why and how come, the meaning changes slightly based on your attitude and how you say it. So if, uh, if a friend of mine is, is telling me like, oh, I can't come to the party, I, I, might, I might be like, what, how come? How come? Why not? You know? Um, but I, I might ask someone at a factory like, oh, how come you use this, this material and not that one? So there's nothing offensive about what I'm saying. I'm just using like, why do you do this and not that? Or how come you do this and not that? All right. So kids will often use how come, but anybody can use that as well. Why typically sounds a bit more professional. You would probably not see how come in, in like a, I don't know, legal document, something like that. Uh, so if you're, if you're feeling nervous at all, just use why. But really, uh, there's nothing wrong with how come. So especially in casual conversations, or I'm asking, especially like, like if you watch a comedian, so a comedian talking, they're always like, like how come, like how come people always do this? I mean, you might hear someone say why, but how come is a kind of more casual way of saying that, okay? 
All right. Uh, oh no, the chat skipped down again. Uh, okay. Now why did that? That's weird. Did I? Did it like it like skip down again on me? Oh no. All right. I have. Uh, we are always very shy. Says Tom. It's exactly like in the personal classes to ask a doubt about yeah, ask the doubt to the teacher. Yeah. And so again, like this is so you've given me another example here. So you said to ask a doubt. And again, I understand human psychology and as a teacher, as someone trying to guide you and help you learn, like I know that you probably will not, if I'm in a real class with people, I will say, hey, who wants to speak? And nobody wants to speak. <laughs> and so I don't, I don't force you to speak. I don't recommend you speak before you're ready, but I do recommend like, you're like, oh, like, how do we do this? How does this, how can, how can we make sense of this? How do we understand this? So to ask a doubt, so to ask a doubt. Now you probably mean, let me make sure I got that correct. Uh, yes, to ask a doubt to the teacher. So ask a doubt to the teacher. So you could just make this easier. It's like just to ask a question. Okay, so when you're talking about the word doubt, you could mean like to address a doubt or to um, probably it'd be more like a concern, concern. So I'm asking about a, like I have a concern about something, but question is really the easiest, fastest, simplest way to say that. So to ask a teacher about something or to ask a teacher a question. To ask, a, I'd like just to ask a question. So when in doubt, so when you are in doubt or you have a doubt in something uh, or have a doubt about something, it's much better just to like begin with something. What's the simplest, easiest way you think uh, to express something? And you can just say, I have a question. So I have a question about something. I have a question or I have a doubt about something. Both of those are fine. Or I have a concern about something. I have a problem with. So we usually have a problem with something, uh, but a question or doubt or concern about something. Uh, let's see, Ran Thea, being from Chicago, have you heard uh, that it means onions? Yes, uh, so, uh, and I don't know if that's true or not. That That's the story that the word Chicago comes from some like Indian word like Chicago, which means wild onion. So I don't know if that's correct or not, but I like the name Chicago. I think that's a cool name for a, for a city. Let's see. So Alan Lee says, didn't versus hadn't. Can't comprehend the difference. Awesome. All right. Well, let's help you figure it out. Let's get you fluent in these words. Now, remember, again, it depends on the situation. So if we just look at did, not, and had not. So let's think about some sentences. When could we use this? So did not, I'm just talking about like something I uh, like maybe physically did do or did not do. Like I did not. And we always want to keep the examples simple. So who is doing it and what are you doing? So I did not eat. I did not eat. I did not eat. We're just talking about here is now, uh, here is in the past sometime, and we're going into the future. So I did not eat. It's just like at some point in the past, it could be a specific point or it could be a time period. It doesn't matter. We're just talking generally about the past. So yesterday I did not eat breakfast. So it doesn't matter like uh, if, if that was at 8 o'clock in the morning because I, didn't, I did not eat. I didn't do it anyway. All right. I did not eat. I did not eat. So this is uh, just a very basic idea about like what you did and what you did not do. Okay. So I ate, if we're talking about something we did, like I ate, we can even use like uh, here. What's, what's a simpler way to say this because we don't use like a irregular verb here. Let's just say I walked. So yesterday I walked and that could be you know, at a specific time, like I walked across the room uh, or I walked 
through a park or I walked somewhere, or uh, I did not. So at first, we really just want to get fluent. We want you to get lots of practice with one thing at a time to really understand that, oh, look, like I walked, I did not walk. So you can do this by yourself. Just get lots of examples. If you don't remember if it's an irregular verb or not, uh, just get like past. You can. This is basically past simple. Um, but you can just get examples of this from Google or chat GPT or whatever or a textbook or something. Uh, but you're just trying to get really good at this so you recognize the pattern. It's the pattern that recognizes, oh, like now I'm fluent because I can understand when to use this and I, I know the pattern very well, the same way children do. So children, you can tell that they learn by recognizing patterns because they, they get, like their brain gets scrambled when they hear an irregular verb. So that's why kids say like, I goed to the park. And we say, no, no, it's you went to the park. And kids are like, why? You know, like, why do you do that? You know, and we just say, well, it's the way it is. That's how we do it. All right. So I walked. I did not walk over here. All right. And so once you get comfortable, you understand what this is. I did not. Then we can put it together just to make it faster. So I didn't. I did not. So I did not eat. But casually, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. You hear how this blends like didn't, didn't, didn't. We don't really say didn't. We say didn't. So it's like the second D here basically disappears. It's like didn't. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't eat yesterday. I didn't eat breakfast yesterday, okay? So now we had had not. Now had not gets a little bit more complicated, uh, but we'll just look at have as an example. So let me erase this over here, all right? But hopefully you got did and did not, and, uh, and that makes sense so far. So it's just something you did or did not do in the past, okay? Now, uh, rather than kind of comparing did not with had not, we'll just look at have and had, okay? Just to make this a bit more clear. Now, uh, I made a video a while ago talking about the verb have by itself. Um, and just like I talked in this video about like a physical understanding something physically and then we understand the f uh, figurative meaning of it, we can learn that vocabulary, like a word like have, we should learn this the same way. So we have something like I have a marker. Okay, so I physically am holding something like this. I have a marker, or I can talk about a part of myself, like I have green eyes, or I have short hair, I have uh, like a gray t-shirt, okay? So these are things that I have. But I can also have experience. So something is a part of me, like I have experience doing something. Okay, so I have experience like like I have uh, like I have and we would just use this uh, talking about the past like I have been a teacher. So I have been a teacher. Uh, this can be talking about one point in time. So maybe 20 years ago I was a teacher. Well, let you, since I'm teaching right now, we'll do, we'll do something different. So I had been, uh, or I have been, uh, let's say a swimmer. So I used to be a swimmer and I am not anymore. Okay, so I can, I can have this and uh, have it be two different meanings actually. So if I'm talking about one thing, like many years ago, I, I swam, so I did swim before and now I do not. So I have been a swimmer. So at one time, this just means I have the experience of that thing. I have the experience of that. So just like I can have this marker, I can have green eyes, I can have an experience, like me being a swimmer, it's still part of me. I'm not swimming right now, but it's, it's a part of me, like this shirt or this marker or my eyes or whatever, okay? And so I can have, I, I have been a swimmer like in the past, uh, but we can also, usually when people want to make it clear, because you can be talking about like a whole period of time. So I have been 
uh, a swimmer for 10 years. Okay, so that means like from now and into the past, I have been doing something. All right. Now I had not. If we're not, if we're talking about had, like I had not. We're still talking about some moment uh, in the time, in like in the past. Let me clean this up for you. Now watch how this gets like a little bit. It's a little bit tricky, but if you if you kind of look at it on a uh, on a timeline here, it gets a little bit easier to understand. So let's say we're going to have uh, like two periods of time. So this is uh, I don't know like ten years ago, uh, and this is today over here. So at this point, so right here at this point, uh, like I had not. So I had not swam. Okay, so for all this time over here, I like I had not I had not swam. Okay, but until this point, like this is the first time I try swimming. Okay, so from here, like now I have I have this experience, and I, I did not have that experience. So we're still talking about something, uh, just the same thing, like my green eyes. So if I say like. Uh, like I had green eyes, or let's say I had, I had blue eyes here, uh, but they they became green ten years ago. All right, so now they are green. We're we're really talking about like a change in something happening uh, when we're talking about this this like usage of like had not done something or something I had not had that experience that kind of thing. So I had not swam here. And then I had swam over here. So over here, this time is had not. So I did, I did not have that experience. And over here, I did. So I had the experience. Okay? And then it just, like, depending on when we're talking about that, uh, like, I did not and I had not. It's just, like, we're talking about kind of an experience you have, something that's a part of you, uh, rather than something you did. All right, so we, we still can be talking about the same thing, like, like I did not swim if I'm talking about the activity. But if I'm talking about myself, I want to talk about the experience, like, oh, I, I had not. I had not swam then. So I had not swam when I was five years old. But when I was 10 years old, I had. So I had, I had swam when I was uh, 10 years old. Or we can use even, uh, we'll just use a, like a, simpler, a simpler verb like play. All right. So at this point in time, like uh, let's say my, I didn't get like a, like a video game or something like that. So I, I had not played the game when I was five years old. But when I was 10, I had played the game. Okay. So again, we can talk about a physical thing like I had a Nintendo. Okay, so I did have one or I did not have that. But when you're talking about like had not, we're really, it's like, it's, it's, it's kind of like a backwards way of talking about an experience, but that's what we're, that's what we mean. So I had the experience or I had not had the experience. This is a tricky thing, but this is why I'm trying to give you many examples of it. Uh, and so like ha had not and did not are like, you, you can talk about the same thing. Let me maybe give you some more examples if this is making, I want to make sure this is clear for everybody. So I'll put our timeline back up here, make this a, a little bit clearer. So here is our timeline. Here is now. And then we have the past and the future. So if I want to use like, I didn't, play. So I can talk about like any time in, in the past, let's say right at this point, so I was 10 years old and, uh, and I got, uh, I got like a video, like a Nintendo, you know, I got Mario or something like that. So I got Mario. All right. So at this point in time, I didn't play Mario because I, I didn't have the game. So I didn't play Mario. I didn't play Mario. Okay? And you can be more specific. Like, I didn't play Mario until I was 10 years old. So I didn't play Mario 
until I was 10 years old. And so it's a, it's a slight difference in the meaning, but we're talking about the activity. So I did not do that thing. I did not play. So I got, I was born here, I'm zero, and now I'm 10 years old. And this whole time, I did not play Mario. I had not, I, like I didn't have the, uh, like a Nintendo or something. But until, so until this time, I had not played that, all right? So again, I can change this and talk about uh, the experience of that. So I had not played, all right? So I had not played Mario until I was 10 years old. So you can say both of these things, but the meaning is, is slightly different. One is talking about the activity, and one is talking about me as having the experience, okay? So it's basically the same thing. It's just, are you talking about the activity, like playing Mario, or are you talking about me having the, the activity or having the experience? Whenever we're talking about have in that way, we're just talking about me having an experience doing something, okay? So I, I explain this even further in that video about have. Hopefully uh, this makes sense. But this is how you can use these in like they're similar, but when we talk about I had not, and then we can make it shorter as hadn't, so here, I hadn't, I had not played that. I did not have the experience of playing Mario. And I can also say, I didn't play. So just a simpler way is like, I didn't play here, and I did play here. So I did not, and did, okay? And here I can say, I had not, or I had, okay? So I had played Mario, uh, and then I can talk about like, maybe if I want to be like even, even more complicated, I want to explain it a little bit further, maybe we have three time periods here. So here, I had not played Mario. And then I got a Nintendo, so this is maybe from like age 10, to age 13 or something. And so I had played, I had played, I had played over here, but then I stopped, so I don't play anymore, all right? So it just depends on what you're talking about, but it's important not to think about the vocabulary, you want to think about the situation first. So are we talking about the activity or are you talking about yourself and you're kind of describing yourself as having an experience, okay? So when you have an experience, it becomes a part of you, just like your memories are a part of you, okay? So my green eyes, you can see that physically. You can't see my experiences, but I can tell you about them. Like I have, like I have experience doing something, okay? So I had not done something, and then I had, and then maybe I, I stopped doing that thing, okay? All right, that was a pretty long explanation. Let me know if that makes sense or if you need me to go uh, deeper into that, but hopefully that makes sense. Availability is a difficult word too. Yes, again, like if you learn the pieces of these words, availability, availability, availability. So if you'd like to listen to me pronounce all of these things, you can hear, uh, what is it, over 2,000 words and sentences in Frederick. So just click on the link below to get the app. All right, but I can't get it A. Drew, I really watch every video you make and I understand the idea of varied review, but I can't get it A. Okay, Sisip, let me make sure this is clear. All right, uh, so just so people understand the difference between uh, learning English as a second language and learning English as a first language. So when you learn English as a second language, you begin with your native language. So it's English as a second language, like, okay, I'm learning it not the way a native would learn it, but I'm getting some explanations or translations or something. Uh, so I'll just use, uh, let's say, Chinese as an example. So I'm from China, uh, and I'm trying to learn English over here, and then I have, again, some kind of translation to learn that. 
Uh, and so I learn, uh, I don't know, what is, I don't know any Chinese actually. <laughs> it's probably not the best example. Uh, I think like Shei Shei's uh, hello, I guess. Hello, maybe. Ni hao, ni hao, I think. Um, uh, but again, if I take something like that, I'm just learning a translation of that rather than me trying to understand it like a native. And then what happens is you will learn the word hello, and then the teacher will say, okay, repeat after me. We're going to say the word hello, 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 hello. And then you might get good at saying the word hello. And maybe your teacher is a native speaker, maybe they're not, maybe they have good pronunciation, maybe they do not have good pronunciation, uh, but this is typically what you are doing. So learning English as a second language, you begin with your native language, your first language, and then you learn English through that. So you get explanations or translations, you learn some vocabulary or phrases or grammar or whatever, and then you just repeat those things again and again. All right. So what's different with uh, English as a first language is you, you begin with uh, like the English word, uh, but it's coming from some kind of situation. So here, let me, let me make this a little bit easier. So instead of using like Chinese or Thai or Japanese or whatever the language is, we're beginning with just a situation in life. Like here's a marker or something heavy and it falls on my head. Ah, ouch. So the situation is something hurt me. That's the situation. Now, even if I can't explain that, I can see what's happening with that thing. Just like this. Some action is happening or I'm speaking or I see something or I'm in a situation like I'm ordering food or whatever, uh, but some vocabulary is being used at the same time, all right? Now the same thing, like if I just show you what this is, I hold a physical thing like this and just say marker. Marker. So the situation is, is the thing. I'm talking about this. Situation doesn't mean like, or it doesn't have to mean uh, like some complicated process or whatever, like, I don't know, ordering food at a restaurant or something like that. The situation, it just means you're able to, to learn directly rather than going through your native language. Okay? So that's how we learn. We have the situation and then the English vocabulary. Now, here's where the naturally varied review comes from. And this is just one example of naturally varied review. All right, again, I gave you the example before. You begin with a word in Chinese or Italian or French. You learn the English word for that and you start repeating that again and again. But what natives are doing, they're beginning with a situation and they're learning the vocabulary for that. But, all right, here's the change. Here's the big difference. They're also learning other ways of saying that same thing. So if I drop something on my head, I might say, ah, you know, it's slightly different than ouch. So I might say if I fall, something falls on my head or I get hurt, I say like, ah, like, ah, like that. Or I say, ouch. Or if, you know, I see my, my grandfather does something and he curses a lot, he's like, fuck, God, you know, depending on how painful it is. So someone might say like, fuck, or damn it, or something like that, okay? But they're learning all of these different things, and this is the varied review that we get from learning like a native. So if we see different people getting hurt, then we will learn different ways of expressing that, okay? And then we're not really, like, you, you see, it's, it's similar to repetition because the point, you still have to review. So this is a kind of review where we're just, we just call this repetition. We're just repeating the word, hello, you listen to the teacher on the, on the audio and then you repeat after the teacher, hello, hello, hello. But again, the problem is when you get into the real world, people say different things even for the same situation. So instead of using a, a word in your native language and translating it into English, you actually have just a situation. So the situation is like, what do you say when you get hurt? What do you say when you greet somebody? What do you say when you, when you are late? What do you say when you are surprised? So sometimes, like, because I'm just used to, you know, being in Japan, if I'm surprised by something, I might say like, bikurishita. Bikuri, bikuri shita. I might, for the kids, I say bikuri donkey. The Japanese learners will know what I'm talking about. But I'd say bikuri donkey. <laughs> As a joke, that's just the name of a, like a restaurant out here. It's like a st stupid thing that I say, but it always makes people laugh. 
Um, but again, you can see that like in these different situations. So I'm getting natural examples and varied examples from different people, the same way a native would. Okay, so you can learn this way, like this is what we do when I was building uh, Fluent for Life. I wanted to have all these different examples. So you get real people, like what does this woman say when she's sad or she's telling a sad story? What does this guy say when he's telling a sad story? All right, so this is one example of naturally varied review. Another example is if we just even take a word like ouch, and then we hear different people saying that same word. So what does a grown woman sound like when she says ouch? It's like ouch, uh, you know, whatever. Or a grown man's like ouch, or a kid's like ouch. So they sound different, okay? And then you get used to you get used to all of these different pronunciations, and so when you are in a conversation with someone, now you feel very, very confident about this. So this is an example over here about a greeting, but we could do the same thing over here. So instead, the situation is greeting someone. We learn the vocabulary. We do learn the word hello, because you will hear hello from people. But we also hear hi, we learn uh, hey, or we learn how's it going, what's up, what's going down, how's life, how's the family, how you been. We learn all these different things and we get lots of different examples from different speakers saying them. And this is how natives get prepared for real conversations while a typical learner who's learning English as a second language, they learn like one word. They're prepared for one clear example of a word. And so if you don't hear that in a conversation, you're like, oh my, what did that person say? And hello is even something pretty basic, but you might, like you can see, I gave the example before about ouch, uh, but it could be for anything. So naturally varied review means we're, we're trying to simulate what natives are getting in the real world, all right? And so a native child will hear something from their mother and their father and their teacher and their friend. Each of those people will say different things or they get something from a television show or a movie or radio or a book or something. They're getting all these different varied examples. And so when you're just learning about something, you're just getting like a few uh, examples of something, maybe like the first two or three examples are good for helping you hear just this pronunciation of it. But actually your mind stops listening because it's getting bored of all of these same examples again and again. Hello, 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 hello. Okay? So you're not, you're like the learning, basically it, it kind of stops after this, this level here. So even if you get uh, what people call spaced repetition, so you're, you're learning the word hello and then you hear it again later to help you remember it, uh, it becomes much more memorable as a network like this. We've got all these different things that are, that are woven together. They're connected like that. So this is regular repetition as an English learner and this is naturally varied review. So we have lots of different examples. I gave some examples earlier in this video like we could have different grammar or different, uh, like different tenses for the same thing. So I played and I will play. This is naturally varied review. So children will learn these examples and they start connecting, okay, like yesterday I played, right now I am playing, tomorrow I will play. And so if I will play tomorrow, then probably I will eat or I will do something else. And so that's how they learn the vocabulary. Like we're not talking about right now, we're talking about something in the future. But they're not thinking like as a grammar point, like, oh, that's the future continuous or whatever. They're just thinking like, what's the situation about that? So naturally varied review connects uh, these different ideas with a particular situation. And so you get lots of good nuance there. Like, do we say like, hey, uh, or howdy in a, like a, a professional meeting or something? Like maybe if I'm at a meeting of cowboys or something, I might say that, but typically I would say hello, or how is everyone, or how are you, or something like that. So it gets a little bit different, but because you're focusing on the situation, it's like, ooh, that person is wearing a tie. So he's probably going to speak a little bit more professionally. Or that guy is just wearing like jeans and a t-shirt or something. And so he's going to be a bit more casual, 
all right? So we have all these clues that are teaching us, but that's only if we focus on the situation and learn from that and then get lots of varied examples of that thing, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. All right, teacher, I have a doubt about the use of a for you or to you, says Olympia. Ah, you mean like for? Four. And this is an example where sometimes you can have different things, so different vocabulary mean the same thing. So I could have like four, for you, and to you. So I, I might send something to you, uh, or I might say like this is a present for you. So both of those are fine, you can use those when you're talking about moving from one thing or one person to someone else, okay? So when we're talking about like to you, it's kind of focusing on the, the direction. It's the same basic idea. So this is a present, like, and I'm sending it to you. So to you, like, not, not in some other direction over here. I'm sending it to you. Okay, so that's the direction we're moving in, just like we talked about before. Uh, so if we have like into, we're going, we're moving, we're talking about motion, the direction into a particular place or to a particular place. <coughs> and so if we're talking about for, for is like, it's more like the, like the end location. All right, it could be the purpose of something or the end, like the delivery place where we're going. So it's a present, I'm sending a present to you and the present is for you also. So they mean basically the same thing. You can use them in the same situation, but you can see how it's uh, to a native, a native would explain it this way. So they would think, oh, okay, like I'm sending it to you. Like I'm not, you know, like let's say I have a present for you, but I'm sending it to your mom. Okay, so I'm sending a present to your mom and maybe she will give it to you later. So again, we're still talking about direction uh, when we're talking about two. But four, it's like, okay, like it's yours. It's for you, okay? Like this video is for you, but I'm talking to you right now. Like, I'm, like it's, the purpose of it is for you, it's yours, but I'm also talking about the motion from me to you, okay? So isn't this interesting? We get lots of even simple words today, but as you understand them, and remember, understand them as situations. That's how you become confident about using them. So you might feel good about, okay, now I understand how to use to, because we're talking about to, like I'm sending something to you. I'm going to the moon, all right? I'm going to my friend's house. All right, but this thing is for you, like the purpose or the end, the end idea is you over here. All right, let's keep moving over here. Uh, hello from Georgia, nice to see everybody there. Okay, I think I had that. Uh, let's see, I can't do it myself and I'm in Italy and I'm learning Italian and English and I don't know why it's hard to do it by myself. Yes, so like in general, just trying to learn a language by yourself is difficult because you have to, there's like three things you have to do. You have to find the information then you have to organize it, and then you have to teach it to yourself. So what natives are doing, like often people, people are not, uh, they're not like active about their learning of their native language. So a young child is not like, how can I learn like all the uses of two at the same time? They're not thinking about that at all. It's just their parents, if they're, if they're in a situation where they need the vocabulary, the parent will use that vocabulary. So mom says, I'm going to the store. I'll see you. I'm going to the bathroom. I'm going to my friend's house. And so they learn that usage of it, all right? And then they, they learn like other usages later. So it's difficult to try to learn by yourself because you have to be in situations or watch other people being in situations to understand the vocabulary and when you should use it. So it's really difficult to find this. And, and, I, and I had this same problem uh, as I was teaching myself Japanese. So I didn't have a teacher. I tried going to Japanese lessons and, and I hated it because <laughs> it was just more, 
excuse me, uh, of the same traditional lessons that didn't get me fluent. Uh, and so I started, once I discovered I should learn Japanese as a first language, not as a second language, then I start getting more examples. Uh, but yes, it's still difficult to do it by yourself, and that's why it's good to have a teacher. So I couldn't find anyone who could teach me like I teach English. So I wish I had a teacher. I still do. It would be great if I could find a Japanese teacher. Even my own wife is like too busy to teach me. <laughs> so I ask her like, hey, what do you think about this? I think I get maybe, maybe two questions a week. So in one week, I might be able to ask like two questions. But what I do do, uh, like the smart thing I do is like I pay attention to what she says in different situations. So while she's talking with like this group of people or kids or somebody else, they're in this situation, what does she say? And so that's how I'm learning, all right? And you don't need to have like a family to do this. Uh, you can get lots of examples or you can just do what we do, like have everything organized for you in Fluent for Life. So that's how you can do it. So yes, it is a little bit tricky to do it. It takes more time. Uh, and if you don't understand the vocabulary, then usually you're just like using a dictionary. So you're going back to translating, but you're just doing it yourself, all right? So if you are trying to teach yourself, use an English to English dictionary. Try to look things up in English if you can, uh, but that'll make it easier. All right, so it says, how's it going? I just want you to make a complete video. I just want you to make a complete video about your program. Says Syed. Uh, yeah, I'm actually kind of working on that right now. But if you have any specific questions about Fluent for Life, what information, and anyone can answer this, uh, what, what, if you would like to join Fluent for Life, but you are not joining it, I'd love to know why. So let me know, like, it guarantees fluency, it teaches you the way a native would be learning, but it's much more efficient because we're going to take specific things we want you to learn and then make sure you learn those and then you get fluent in that and then you move on to the next thing. So let me know if there are specific questions you have about it. I'm watching YouTube videos about dishwashing. Should I keep watching new dishwashing videos or the same videos again? Uh, and should I watch those until I'm familiar with everything about that topic? Yes, if you, if you want to know about washing dishes or anything else, then yeah, watch lots of videos about that. And so you will learn, uh, just like in the, uh, the example of uh, like making espresso that I gave before, so if we, if we look at like, this is called a bell curve because it looks kind of like a, like a bell, like that little like ding dong, a bell. So you will have uh, like certain vocabulary that gets used very frequently in conversations. So if I go to order food at a restaurant, like uh, the, if we have like 50 people who go to order food at a restaurant, then maybe the first person says like, may, may I have whatever. Uh, and then like person number two says, can I get whatever, okay? So you will hear like, may I have, can I get, and you will hear lots of different examples, but some examples it will look like this. So you have some things that are used very frequently and then other things that maybe are not used as frequently. So natives will learn all these, but they will use just maybe like one or two of these and they will, like I say the same thing when I go get, you know, coffee somewhere. Uh, but anyway, uh, yes, so in the, like the dishwashing example, if you watch a bunch of different videos about people washing dishes, then you will get some vocabulary like scrub the pot or scrub the pan. So scrub. And you learn, oh, you're connecting like, like here's washing and here's scrubbing. It's like, I'm like really pressing hard to clean something. That's scrubbing. That's so you learn the difference the slight nuance between like wash or wipe. So right now, if I just like wipe the board, like I just wipe the board, you know. If I take maybe like water and soap, then I'm washing it. And if I really have something like, wow, this is not coming off, I'm like, Argh! I'm really scrubbing very hard with the eraser, okay? So you learn these subtle differences, the slight differences in the vocabulary as you do it. So uh, depending on what your goal is, if you want to just know a lot of vocabulary about that, yes, like watch, I mean, it's, it's a good idea to watch the same video um, like maybe one or two times, but then try to listen to it and then also read the transcript if you can of that video. Uh, so this is what we do in Fluent for Life because you're going to learn a little bit differently each time and you will learn a little bit more. So usually when you're watching a video, so even people watching this video right now, 
if we think about like a timeline. <clears throat> so you watch a video, like for the first, I don't know, maybe like minute or two, you are paying attention to what I'm saying. But then for, I don't know, like another minute, you're thinking about what do you want for dinner? Like, oh, I'm hungry. What do I want for dinner? And so you're not listening to what I'm saying. <laughs> Uh, but then you like like oh look at that drew did this over here now i'm not paying attention again okay so it's good to go back and review because like there are things that you miss in the video or you know whatever you're watching dishwashing videos but it's the same thing so you can get maybe like one two three times just watching the video to make sure you get everything all right but if you keep watching it more than that you're probably not going to learn very much it's when you're using your time, it's better to switch to another video at that point, all right? But just think about what your goal is. If you really just like learning about washing dishes or something, or maybe you're like a dishwasher at a uh, store or a, a restaurant and you wanna talk with people about that, then yeah, that's a great way to do it. That's really very review. All right, uh, and let's see, two and four are simpler words that make things quite tricky. Yes, please, oh no, now the, <laughs> now the chat's, ah. The chat uh, jumped down on me again. Uh, please explain forego versus foregone. It's confusing. Uh, well, like forego means like you're not going to do something. <coughs> and this is like a, a, little, a little bit tricky for uh, thinking about the present and the past. But if I forego something, it, it's just a more, maybe a more educated way of saying like, I'm not going to do something. And, and this is a good thing uh, if you're in a conversation and you, you're like, uh, I want to say the word forego, but I mean, people don't really use that. You might, as a lawyer, you might use that or you might see that written on a legal document, but it would be very rare to hear that in a conversation. Uh, like if I, like, mm, yeah, like you, the only times you'll really hear that is like a foregone conclusion so foregone conclusion just means like you know what's going to happen before it happens. So like it's a foregone conclusion that Drew is going to be talking about fluency. So before you watch my video, like you know that's what I'm going to talk about because that's what I talk about. So if it's like a surprise, then it's not a foregone conclusion because you don't know what I'm talking about. But then like to forego something, the only time you would really hear that is like, um, like I will forego something in the future, it just means I won't do that thing to forego that thing in the future. But it, like it's it's not very I don't know it's not really essential that you learn that. Uh, maybe you can give me some examples if you'd like uh, of when you heard that. But it's not really essential that you know it. Thanks, teacher from Mexico, living in Philadelphia, best class ever. Happy, improve my English every day, taking notes with um, younger class. What do you mean? Like younger, like you mean like younger people or something? What, like younger people watch? All right. Uh, usage of since and for. Okay. So this is a different thing. Now remember, we talked about like why it's important to learn words from a situation rather than the vocabulary itself. So remember the English as a second language approach is we're going to take the word for and then we're going to give you like every, every use of the word for. But then you just forget them and then you get confused in a conversation. So natives don't do this. Natives don't take a word and then give you every use. We learn different situations. And you might learn some of those situations at the same time or it might be a long time between them. So English as a first language. So we talked about a different example of for, like, and again, we, we just think about the situation, like this is a present for you. So like you are the target of that thing, okay? And so what was the, uh, the question was since, uh, since and for. All right, so if we have now, we're back on our timeline again, and if we're gonna talk about since, like usually we began something here, uh, let's say again like 10 years ago, we, we use my Nintendo, my Mario example. So I have been playing Mario for, uh, let's just say 10 years. So I know this is mean, like I'm 40 and this is 10 years old, but let's just say we're talking about this amount of time here. Let's say this is 10 years. So I have been playing Mario uh, for 10 years, all right? A different way of saying that same thing is I have been playing Mario uh, since 
like 10 years ago. It's, exact, it's exactly the same thing. So I have been playing, remember, we're, we're, we're not learning vocabulary, we're learning situations. And then vocabulary go into those situations. All right, so learning English as a first language, a first language, not as a second language. We don't take the vocabulary, we don't start with the vocabulary, we begin with the situation, okay? So we're talking about an amount of time I started in the past, I'm continuing to do it now, and we have these two ways of saying it. So I have been doing something for 10 years. I've been doing that since some, some period of time. Same thing, all right? But this is, this is the construction. Like, it's a little bit slightly easier. It's just three words for 10 years or since 10 years ago, okay? So I can, I can also describe this like I have been playing Mario since I was three. Let's say just like if we're talking about our age. So I have been playing Mario since I was three. I have been, but it's still just talking about this same situation, all right? Now notice the slight difference here, all right? Watch. So I'm trying to kind of get you from the situation to thinking about what the, what the difference in the vocabulary means, all right? Watch closely. If we're talking about four, four is talking about the amount of time. Four. So I have been doing something for this amount of time. But since is talking about the point when we started. All right, that's the main difference, since. So I have been doing something since. It's, again, like th this is a time when, uh, when natives are talking about the same thing. But the slight nuance, the slight difference is, are we talking about the length of time or are we talking about when you started doing it? it you mean the same thing, but it's just like the focus is slightly different, okay? <clears throat> so with a little bit of naturally varied review, so since 2010, so if we started in 2010, since 2010, I have been uh, a professional, uh, I don't know, marker salesman. So I, I have been selling markers for 10 years, okay? So as an example, so we can describe that in the same way. So let's say uh, 2010 is the time we start. So if we want to talk about when we started, okay? So often, like, you will see an example of this, like, for, for businesses, uh, like, they will say, like, since 2000 or since, you know, like, if it's, if it's a really old business, it's, like, since, since 1932. That's because they want to talk about the time when they're, like, when they're doing it. And especially if it's a long period of time, they don't want to say like 452 years. It's like, it, like 1932 sounds like a longer time. It's like, wow, that was <coughs> almost 100 years ago. But you get the difference? So we're, in, in general, we're talking about the same thing. And we can mean the same thing, but the slight difference is, are you talking about when you started since, or are you talking about how long you've been doing the thing for, okay? All right, let's keep moving. Uh, let's see. Perfect explanation, Drew. Okay, is flabbergast the same as mesmerize? Uh, mesmerize is like it's where you're you're trying to hypnotize or to to get people like, whoa, I'm, I'm I like can't control myself. I'm focused on you and doing what you're telling me to do. But being flabbergasted, it just means really surprised and you can't speak. You're just why wow, you're speechless. All right, so they're slightly different things. Uh, let's see, get on the chat and like the video guy says, Lewis, nice to see you there. How come and why? Let's see, teacher, would you explain the meaning of find himself grappling with one problem? All right, so to grapple with, if you think about two wrestlers, grappling comes with like, that's this physical idea of, of you like connected with someone and, and like rolling on the ground and you're fighting with a person. So it's, it's different from like standing and boxing like this. You're connected, you're kind of hugging or holding that person. You have them in a hold of some kind. So that's grappling, all right? So when we grapple with a problem, it, it's like just like two wrestlers are grappling with each other. 
All right, so I'm fighting against something and like it's just a uh, kind of figurative way of saying that I have a problem that I'm fighting with. So right now I'm struggling with something. I'm grappling with that thing. I'm fighting with that thing. It's all the same way uh, or basically different ways of describing the same situation. All right, uh, thank you, teacher. Greetings from Mexico. Let's see, teacher, would you mind, would you explain the meaning of he wound up inventing new ways of teaching English classes? Yes, to like to wind up doing something means like you, like you kind of end up doing it. Maybe you had not uh, intended to do something, but you wound up going to a different place. And this is kind of a tricky idea because like to wind something, we have like, like a little wind up toy. <clears throat> And so the, like the phrasal verb, like to wind up doing something, uh, this is much more advanced because it's harder to understand a connection with like the physical object or whatever. Um, but you can think about it as like, if you wanna connect those two ideas. So uh, I, I can't like I can't say for certain what the origin of that is for this usage, but I could imagine something. So if we have like, here's a, uh, uh, like a wind up, mouse and it's got like those little you know little like wind up key thing on the top of it so that's like so right now i'm going to wind up the mouse and i put him down on the ground here's little wheels on him and he's like doo -doo 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 -doo. we don't know where he will wind up and he's kind of spinning around and then look he wound up here all right so if i even if i can't think of like a logical way to connect those i can come up with a quick story that can help me understand the usage of it, all right? So that will make me feel more confident about doing that. So we start the mouse and like, do 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 and he's going around and whoop, he wound up here. So the mouse wound up here. <clears throat> and again, we go from a physical understanding to a figurative one where like, like I began, uh, like I was living in India and then I moved to Thailand and then I wound up on the moon. Amazing. So it's the same idea of like I was here and I didn't really have a plan. I didn't know where I was going, but well, now I'm here. So you can wind up being in a place or you can wind up doing something. All right, so just like to be, like that's still like a, a verb, like you're still in a location. So I can wind up being somewhere or I can wind up doing something. So maybe I started my career, I thought I would be, uh, I don't know, like a marker, a marker salesman. But then I started, like I wound up selling erasers. Okay, same basic idea. <clears throat> Uh, let's see. Oh, Ellen is back. Konnichiwa. I am always confused about especially and specially. Can you give me some examples, please? So especially, so especially like put, I would recommend putting those in Google and see what you get. If you get something that's like really similar like that, like put those things in Google and look at the different examples because you'll get way more than we even have time to go through here. Um, but like just very quickly, uh, especially is if I'm trying to give some examples of something like, like if I'm uh, a waiter at a restaurant and I say, we've got this thing and this thing and this thing over here, but this thing especially, so I'm trying to like highlight this thing or say that this is a really good thing, like especially, I recommend this one especially. All right, uh, but especially without the E on it, it's just like kind of doing something in a special way. All right, so like uh, I usually make, uh, let's say I have a bakery and I have uh, cupcakes like this. <clears throat> Uh, and like, and you come to my bakery every day and this is just the regular cupcake, nothing special about it. But I say, hey, today I made like this like amazing uh, one, uh, like special for you. Like I made it specially for you, okay? So I, and in this sentence, I can actually use both of those words, but they mean slightly different things. So I made it special, like I made it like the actual cupcake is like, special, so I made it specially for you, like it's like an adverb, like I created it that way. <clears throat> or I can say like, especially for you is like, it's not for other people, okay? So again, the, I, can, I can use the same word even in that situation, but they mean slightly different things. But I would Google it, get more examples. All right, Iran says, cool. Uh, Marcelo says, I struggle a lot to learn how to use though. 
All right, so this is another one of those examples where you are in a certain uh, situation and, and you will hear though, but it would be in different situations. Typically though is if we're saying like, uh, it could be like but, and that's just one situation. So rather than try to give you like every situation of though, think about it like it's hot. Uh, here, I can even say like though, So though it's hot, I went for a walk, or I went outside, make it easier, went outside. So though it's hot, and this is the same thing in this as like, although, you can say that as well. So although it's hot, though it's hot, or even though, in this situation we can use all of these examples. So even though it's hot, I went outside. Although it's hot, I went outside. Though it's hot, I went outside. All right. But remember that we want to focus on particular uh, situations. So rather than think about like a particular word, think about when you would use that and then get more examples of that thing. All right. So uh, like the kinds of things that you're getting here, this is all stuff we do in Fluent for Life. So we look at like specific words, we want to look at them in different ways, hear them from different people, focus on a particular grammar point and spend a lot of time really learning that, reviewing it in different ways. So it just becomes automatic for you. That's the whole point of the program. All right, uh, let's see, Ha says, teacher, I don't know how to use neither and either correctly. Could you explain them and give me some examples, please? All right, neither versus either. And this is an interesting thing because my daughters will uh, be like asking me and we will kind of work on these as well. Also, if you have not clicked that like button, you better click that like button. Click that like button right now while I'm doing this. So first we have either. And remember to think situationally. Okay, think situationally. So either I'm talking about like two of these things or two, two options. So I don't know what to wear. Like I could wear either this gray shirt or a black shirt. Either of them uh, is fine. Either is okay. All right, either. All right, but as soon as we put like the neither on there, whenever we have like an N, you can think about that as like not either. So when you're thinking it's like no, not, like not, not, not either of those things. Like we don't want either of them, okay? So neither, neither shirt is good. So I have a gray shirt and a black shirt and neither of them are good, all right? So both of them are bad, all right? So if I say either, like either thing, it doesn't matter. So either one is fine, okay? But neither is both of them are bad. So both of them are fine, both of them are bad. All right, Google more examples to see more examples of that. But typically when you have something like or versus nor, like it's like, ah, there's that no again, like it probably means not, okay? So look up those examples and you will see more. All right, uh, uh, interesting. Hi, Xavier, have you ever been a swimmer in your life? Well, I, I, have, I have like, you know, been swimming before. I like to swim, but I'm not like on a swim team, if that's what you mean. So no. Hi, uh, Bashir from uh, Afghanistan, living in Malaysia. Have you ever had this kind of experience? Yes, so the same idea. Uh, had not played, didn't play, okay. All right, so just remember we're talking, you can, you can be talking about the same situation, like for and since, but like thinking about it, the slight nuance is just, is it when you started or how long you've been doing that? Okay, but it's basically the same thing. So you don't need to think like, ah, which is it? It's just, you know, just pick one and use it, all right? But as you get better and you understand the nuances and you want to say like, you know, I have been doing something for, and you want to talk about like how long you've been doing it because that's an important thing. Like, uh, like I tell people I have been teaching for 20 years, 20 years, or I could say 20 years. Both of those pronunciations are fine. So if I have been doing it for 20 years, that sounds better than like I started teaching in like, I don't know, 2006 or whatever. If I just use a number, then people have to think about the math. They're like, well, how long is that? So I just do the math for them. Like, oh, it's been 20 years. And people are like, wow, 20 years, that's a long time. Okay. 
So you can, you can use either one of those. Uh, let's see, Xavier says, we used to have a big house or we had a big house. Do you use used to uh, as a no English, as a native English speaker? I struggle to use used to. I think, Xavier, watch, what video was that? It, it might have been last, well, last week or on Monday, but we covered used to and like in, in a bunch of examples of that. But yes, you can exist. Uh, you, could, you could say uh, like we had a big house or we like we used to have. It, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Both of those are fine. <clears throat> Emily says, thanks, uh, Sir Drew. It is now clear to me the difference of didn't and hadn't. Yes, glad to hear it. So whenever you have this, sometimes it's good to spend more time really going deep into that because natives will try to think about this the same way. And rather than just like looking at the logic of it, try to get lots of examples until you really feel confident about it. Again, this is what we do in Fluent for Life. The whole point of it is not just to tell you logically what something happens or what something means like a grammar point. It's like to help you understand it like a native so you use it without thinking. All right, uh, Kyosh uh, says, uh, in daily casual conversations, native speakers are actually use these different expressions, had, didn't, didn't, had, etc., and convey such subtle differences from speakers to listeners. Well, like, again, people, people aren't thinking about that. Like, it's, it's very uh, automatic for a native speaker. Um, and again, like, just to correct your English, you would say, in daily casual conversations, native speakers are actually using, uh, na natives are actually using uh, these different expressions, but yes, so they're like if you stop a conversation and say hey Why did you use did or had or should or whatever if you're asking them that like like they will stop thinking and most people will not they will not like have a good answer for that. So me, I like I'm you know an expert in like being able to explain things and talk about fluency and how it works and how a native would explain that. But many people would they would have to think about that for a moment. So some people they just like uh, they have ways of speaking. They're just using patterns over and over and over again, and so they just like automatically speak without thinking about it. And then they might think. Yeah, I guess I don't know why I said that rather than the other thing. So they're they're probably not like thinking about it that deep. That's why I explain like in the in the since versus for example, nobody's really thinking about that that deeply. Like I just gave an example of when you would. So usually like the kind of uh, it's not really like more intelligent, but it's more when you have to be more thoughtful with vocabulary. So a professional writer will look at these slight differences in words and those slight differences will be important. So just like I gave the example of like how long I've been doing something. So the, the goal is it sounds more impressive to say like 20 years rather than uh, like do something uh, like since a certain time, unless that, unless that period of time is like a really long time ago, all right? So if it's like my business started in like 1602, now that's like, that's much better than saying like 400 years or something. I mean, it doesn't really matter, but like since, since like this long period of time, that, that sounds very impressive to people. All right, so that's, that's when you would think about that, but often people do not. So you can also think about this in your native language, like Nihongo de, you know, Amari kangai tenai, tomo ne, Amari kangai tenai. So you, you probably, it's like an automatic thing that you're doing. Let's see, Orson says, could you please give me more examples about did and had, thank you. <laughs> Google that, all right? Look at that, now chat is working over here. This is, this is kind of weird, let's see. Uh, let's see here. <coughs> um, but yes, if, you, if you're looking up like the difference between those, uh, also watch the video I made about have, and it will talk about that. In general, we're talking about physically holding something, physically, like, again, like my eye, I can't take, I could take my eye out, I guess. Uh, but yeah, it's like a part of me, just like my experiences are a part of me as well. So that's when I have something. All right. Uh, is there logic for the usage of uh, ache and sore? Now, again, like a, a doctor might know like a subtle difference between like like different kinds of pains, and they might have like a cut versus a lesion. 
So a lesion is like a much like bigger, wow, like, and you just kind of learn that or there is certain doctor vocabulary or whatever. So people in a particular industry will know more about it. Uh, but in a, in a general thing, like if I say like, that hurts or that's painful, it doesn't matter. It, like there's, there's no difference between those two. It's just different ways of saying the same thing. So don't, don't try to think about it too much. Uh, but you will just get these over time. The important point about naturally varied review is that you will encounter, so you will meet different people. Um, even if you don't go to an English speaking country, you will meet different people online or just you know listen to them speaking. And then you should be prepared for that. All right. So that's how you become a fluent speaker is being prepared for the vocabulary natives use. <clears throat> All right, Adriana says, wonderful class, glad to hear it. Oh, it's alive. Let's see, is there, all right, I answer that one. Uh, again, Shem says, good morning today. I missed a little of the live stream. I love you, my favorite coach, glad to hear it. <clears throat> Aran says, network, you see the best class from a native teacher, glad to hear it. Uh, you guys are very nice, click that like button and tell five people, say, hey, click that like button. Just tell people you, you know to say, hey, come to this video and click the like button. <laughs> <clears throat> oh my goodness. Get some water. <clears throat> oh, all right, here we go. You know, I don't mind losing my voice for, for a class. It's a lot of fun. All right, the first time I heard ouch was watching Bonanza. <laughs> yes, and so you will hear that. I mean, I've made videos. I think I made a video a long time ago. Um, if you look on my channel for the video called Silence, and I think, because I have a video, I think about that. It's like an older, naturally varied review video I made. Uh, but you can find these on uh, YouTube as well, um, just about like certain expressions or sayings or whatever on uh, like from movies and things like that. And I think actually like other people have made this as well. So there's just an example of telling people to be quiet. <laughs> So you could say like shut up. You will hear that often in like kind of casual conversations, but a like a kind of like the boss of a company or like a, even a boss of some gangsters or something like that will be like silence. Silence everyone. And then so you hear like everyone gets real quiet. <laughs> but you can find that. Look up like a like a supercut about that on the on the channel you will find that. All right, ordinary people need simple solutions learning is too. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to make this complicated. I really want, the, the problem is because people have been learning English uh, as, a, as a second language, they get, they're like thinking about the vocabulary in a very complicated way. So they begin with one word, like four, and then they learn 10 different meanings of it. And then when they're in a conversation, they're like, ah, I don't remember which way is the correct one. Is it like for this or for that or uh, whatever? But natives, natives know like, you know, 20 different uses of for, but it's just for a situation. And so that's how they can, they can make these different in their minds. So part of the way the mind works is that we have different categories for things like kinds of words or ideas or situations in our mind. And then we kind of get more, maybe more specific. So I could get hurt as an example. <clears throat> uh, like, uh, so we'll just say like, I, I get hurt. But then there are different kinds of hurt depending on how bad it is. And so these are nuances that I learned like, wow, is it, is it just ouch or like, mm. Like it's not so bad, like you know when you, you stub your toe, you hurt your toe when you're walking, or you bang your arm or something, and it's not really that painful, but it's just like, mm, ah, I mean, you might say ouch or something, or if you get really like, you know, you get like a, a bullet in the arm, you're like, ah, no, it's something like that. You know, so there are different ways that you learn from the situation as it gets more, we say granular. So we start with like big rocks, and move to more kind of small particular ones for like just this situation. And so when I was saying before, like if you're a writer, you're looking for like something really good just for this situation. But for most people generally, like this vocabulary up here is fine. <coughs> All right, uh, let's see, hello Drew, watching you live for the first time. Thanks for the free videos, yeah, it's my pleasure. Uh, where did I, let's see. All right. Uh, 
Okay, glad here. All right, and Nils is back. Ding dong. <laughs> Hello from Wisconsin. Nice to see you there. Nils. Nils is back. Nils is back. Yoshi again says, you hardly say any filler words and make any pauses either. How and when do you think what you're going to say next? It's all just spontaneous and improvised. Yes, that's correct. Your English is very good, by the way, uh, or at least your written English. Um, Hopefully your speaking is good as well. Uh, so what I'm doing right now, this is what I explain to people, it's called moving like water, where uh, I can be thinking of something and I have a general idea of what I want to say and I let the vocabulary just come out naturally. So I, I teach this in Speak Like Me. So if you have the Native Fluency Blueprint or if you have uh, Fluent for Life, that's included in there. Um, and so. Typically, again, like the English as a second language way of learning is you will learn like one word for something. So just take Japanese example. Uh, we get like a word in Japanese and then we translate that into a word in English. But then in a conversation, if you forget that vocabulary, then uh, you don't know what to do. But in English, because we're learning so many different examples, we usually find something, at least one thing, that we can remember and it's easy to use. And so when I'm in uh, a conversation like, okay, now I can, I can talk about something, I maybe like forget a particular word or phrase that I'm saying, uh, I can easily switch to something else. Okay, so that's, that's the difference. So when I'm in a conversation with people, even then I'm, I'm usually not like, uh, or um, or something, but you know, again, it's just because I've given myself lots of input so I can get lots of different examples of things and I just flow from one to the other. So that's the same thing that I teach, like as you get more examples, so rather than thinking from Japanese into English, you're thinking about situations in English and oh look, like my mom said this and my dad said this and now I said that. And so you have all this, you have like a real, uh, a wealth of, of lots of vocabulary that you can use. And often, like, I can see, usually professional speakers, uh, like, I can tell when they're saying something and then switching to something else. So if you're good at it, you can also notice other people doing it too. And maybe you notice, like, like a tricky thing I will do when I'm speaking like this, I don't, I don't really, like, talk about it. I guess I could make a lesson about that. Uh, but, like, I might be saying one thing and then I'm like, oh, no, I said the wrong thing. So I have to think quickly about, like, how I can rephrase it so I say something, like if I say, uh, like I wanted to say something, I don't know, but I, I meant to say the opposite, so I'll have to change that in my mind and say I did not do something, all right? So there are a couple different things I'm doing, but in general, I just call this moving like water. But you can learn to do this too, it's not hard. The problem is like, instead of getting one example, like a traditional student, you need to get many with naturally varied review. And so with all those examples, it makes it much easier to switch to different things without uh and um and things like that. All right, a lot of things and nuance. Let's see, Suzette, uh, again, hello, sir, please. When you use don't and not. Ah, well, it's just if you do not do something. So like not something is like a physical thing like this, like marker, not marker, not marker, marker, all right? But do not is where we're talking about doing something. So like play baseball, do not play baseball, okay? Get more examples, look up both of those online. <clears throat> uh, Mary says, should we also learn grammar the same way? Yes, so if you're listening to me, like the things I've been explaining about, this is grammar and vocabulary and pronunciation and listening and everything together as one thing because this is how natives learn the language. You can't get a grammar lesson that's not pronunciation or vocabulary because you have all these things combined as one, one thing. So you should just be learning it as a native and then you learn it all at the same time. So even in Fluent for Life, we have uh, like, it could be, a, it's like a grammar lesson, but you're hearing pronunciation and vocabulary and making sure you do things correctly that way. Um, but yes, you learn all of this the same way, it's just learning English as a first language. That's the, that's the whole thing. <clears throat> Sup, Drew, says Ildar, nice to see you there. Thanks a lot, great teacher, Olympia, my pleasure. Uh, let's see, Queen Jed, have you done anything on word stress? If yes, please help me with a link. I want to know much on pronunciation. Yeah, I created a whole app about that. It's called Frederick. Get it in the link before or in the link down below this video. 
So yes, I, I, like, and it's not it's not so much like teaching you about stress in a in like a traditional way. It just helps you understand word stress like a native. So you learn like actually how natives pronounce things, and you learn them step by step. Get the app; it will help you. And if you do not have that app, I would love to know why. Everyone should have that app. <clears throat> All right, uh, let's see. Tar, 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 if I'm pronouncing that correctly. How do we know wind means air thing or rotating key thing? It depends on the situation. It depends on the situation. Okay. <clears throat> and so this is a, like a key to learning the language where you're like, if, if I just say a random word, you don't really know what I'm talking about. So it's always in the situation. And I've, I've used this example before, but like a word by itself is like trying to, trying to stand up one stick. You need to have the meaning, the situation, the context for that thing to stand up like this, all right? So like Japanese, uh, this is like an interesting thing learning about like, like the word for a uh, person like that. It's like, it's like two sticks going up uh, against each other. <clears throat> uh, let's see, Ben says, you are the best teacher. Glad to hear it. Again, thanks for the explanation, says Tom. So to wind up is a higher level, but it is usual. Yes, you can't, like people often wind up, or you can say to end up doing something. So it's like end up might be a better, a better, uh, e easier to understand example of that, but you can wind up doing something or end up doing something as well. Like the mouse example I gave, it's the same thing. So the mouse is like, do -do 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 -do, and it ends up over here, all right? It just ends up doing something. So it's typically uh, what you like don't expect about something. So if you like anticipate something or expect doing something, like uh, expect to do something. So if I expect to go to the beach and then I go to the beach, I don't end up at the beach. Like I went to, the, like that was the point. I'm supposed to go to the beach. But if I'm trying to go to the beach and then I go to the fire department, now that I'm thinking about the fire truck or whatever, uh, then I will be, I end up at the fire department. All right, uh, let's see next. How do native speakers pronounce a word which they don't know? Is there any natural pronunciation approach? Yes, it's called, it's called Frederick. <laughs> so basically what people are doing when they learn uh, and they see a new word they're using, phonics. Phonics is the sound rules of English. So phonics teaches us, like, you basically learn the, the pronunciation patterns of the language. And phonics, like, some people, I don't know, some people will, like, not like phonics because it doesn't cover every word, but, I mean, who cares? It's, like, 84% of the language. If you learn all the rules of phonics and you learn some very common exceptions, then you can learn to pronounce basically anything. And so this is what Frederick teaches you to do. So we have, as an example, you learn the pattern uh, like can, all right? So like the first thing you learn, this is called a consonant vowel consonant or a CVC word, all right? So after you learn the alphabet, like A, B, C, D, we learn two things like an, and then we have can. So we start putting sounds together and then we learn, oh, like if we put an E at the end of this, the E becomes silent and the A says its own name. And so we get the word cane. So can, like we have a can of soup or something, becomes uh, like a cane, like a candy cane, okay? And so if you learn the rules for this, then you can take like this kind of thing and you find uh, like A-N-E or something like that at the, at, the, at the end of a longer word, then you have a pretty good idea of how you would pronounce it, all right? So most words, you can figure them out, and that's what natives are doing. They're using these uh, phonetic rules, the sounds, the sound rules of English, to learn those pronunciations. <clears throat> All right, let's see how, okay, I got that one. Bruno says, finally, I could make it. We're live, good to see you again, Drew, what's up? Aran Theo says, neither shirt is good, neither of them are good. Yep, that's fine. What's the role of hand manipulations in conversations? You mean like, while I'm moving like this? I mean, I could, I could just stand here and not move my hands around. I mean, typically, I mean, I'm not like, I'm not like Italian or something, like I'm really moving my hands. It's just a, like a cultural thing, or if I'm trying to, trying to show something. Typically, when I'm teaching something to people, I want to show 
something physical, like I'm bringing something together so you understand what I'm talking about. That's why I use my hands a lot when I teach, but I might not do that if I'm talking with a friend of mine. You know, it just depends on the situation. Depends on the situation. Let's see here. And, uh, all right, nice. I can't believe, uh, Bonnie is there. Okay, let's see. Uh, my sand yellow, Mike and yellow. Sorry, so, so you notice like what I'm doing when I maybe pronounce them correctly, I'm using phonics to try to pronounce them. But I'm also using like what I know about maybe the, the pronunciation rules of different languages, all right? So like in Japanese, like, uh, like what's an, like like an example like so in English I would say this word is like karate this is how we pronounce it in English but in Japanese it's like karate we don't say t we say te because it's like hand te karate all right but you learn those things as you as you get more uh, experience with the language. All right, uh, Bruno says, Drew, is there any way to hit you up? Email, DM, Morse code. I'd love to know more about your program, Fluent for Life. Now, that's interesting. I'm wondering why, like, some chats are coming through, but some are not. I guess maybe maybe people are, like, sending me a direct message or something like that. I guess that's how that's happening. Just send us an email at, uh, at info at englishanyone.com. But if you have any questions about Fluent for Life, uh, you can just post them here. <clears throat> Kiyoshi, again, I'm much better at writing than speaking. That's why I'm here on your channel. Your advices are very practical. Thank you. No, it's my pleasure. Remember, advice is not countable. Just like I've got some pasta in my hand, I've got some water, I've got some advice. Now, if I want to talk about pieces of advice, if I want to count them, like I got a good piece of advice, like piece of advice, like a piece of cake, that kind of thing. So I got a good piece of advice from a friend. Or you just say, I got some advice. And this is just a common thing as you, you learn these examples, like what's countable and what's not. Uh, so it's the same thing like information. So I got some good information. I got some good advice. I got a good piece of information, a piece of advice. Let me give you a piece of advice. All right, let me give you like one, one specific thing. All right, but it's my pleasure. All right, though we enjoy these lessons, it is time to save the voice. All right, it looks like, are we getting down to the end? It looks like we did. Olympia says yes. And right as we're getting to the end of the lesson, let's slow. Let's slow. All right, so Olympia says, I told him to drink water. Yes, so how is that? Wait, what are you guys doing to send me? Why are some of those chats coming through as a, as, it's like some of them are not coming through and some of them are. I don't know why that is. Now, I just reinstalled the YouTube app on my phone. <coughs> I noticed the YouTube app does something very stupid and it, it like takes up all of your phone storage and it like there's no way to delete it or at least I couldn't find anything like the instructions online are like, yeah, just delete the app and reinstall it. <laughs> what? That's it's kind of a silly way to <clears throat> design an app. But yes, uh, thank you very much. I will enjoy my a nice uh, little bit of water over here. I got a sports drink today too because I'm there you go. He is drinking water. Thanks. Now here you would say, thank God. Thank God. Not thanks God. If you're talking to God, you're like, thanks to you, God. But if I'm just like thanking God in general, I just say, thank God. Thank God. <sighs> yes, feeling good. All right. Well, we've got time for maybe like one or two more questions. Uh, but if you have questions about Fluent for Life, or Frederick, or anything else, like any programs you'd like to know about, or if you have like, you know, questions about pronunciation or whatever. <clears throat> and look at it, and there, and there goes another one, like I stuck all the time when I start speaking English, but interestingly enough, I always notice the mistakes of non-native speakers do while they speak. Can you explain what kind of situation I'm in? <laughs> yes, that's a very common one, actually. Um, so when you notice like native speakers, or non-native speakers or whatever make a mistake. And this is a common thing. Um, it means you're like, you're getting quite good, but you just haven't practiced enough yourself to use those things correctly. So if you make mistakes, even though you notice other people, <clears throat> and, and some of that, like, like you might, like uh, an example that I used to make a mistake in Japanese, I'd be like, like, uh, like I would say like, 
like walking walking at the park or whatever, like the Japanese version of that. Um, but I would say it incorrectly because that, like the English version of it, I was kind of thinking through the English grammar rather than understanding it as a native. And so a Japanese person, it's like they're kind of thinking about that grammar a little bit differently uh, than I would in English. So again, once I start learning it the English way, it becomes a lot easier. But you still need to get lots of examples. So all the things that I cover, I try to give many examples of them, uh, but you still need like many more and not just from me. So it's really important, probably uh, like the, my like favorite thing about Fluent for Life is that it gives you so many different native examples. We probably have like a hundred different native English speakers in the program that are giving you audible, like you're listening to them or you're actually seeing different people giving explanations about whatever. Um, but the point is that you're, you're kind of learning like a native, it's simulating a native environment, but a much more efficient one. So it's not just like you being at somebody's house, it's like you being at someone's house with experts that are explaining how everything works. And so you learn it very quickly that way. <clears throat> All right, let's see. All right, and so now, now like chat is like kind of coming back or not. This is really weird. I don't know why I didn't have chat on my phone before, uh, and now we do. Uh, Bruno says, besides getting lots of comprehensible input, what do you think, uh, when do you think we should start speaking? Well, it's just you, you start using things when you feel comfortable with them. Remember, it, like, you don't get fluent in the whole language. You get fluent in individual words and phrases or grammar points, whatever you feel comfortable with. So you can start speaking at any time. Like if I'm teaching English to a, a complete beginner, and on the first day, if I have them understand something, and they start feeling comfortable, and they can understand it and use it confidently, then they'll start speaking it. But they will speak that. They will use that vocabulary. It doesn't mean they can use other things fluently. So usually what happens as you're learning, you're trying to improve the vocabulary you already know, so you become fluent in that vocabulary, and then you expand your vocabulary as well. But you maybe not feel uh, so confident about that yet. So you think about like the, like if you're trying to use a new thing, like you, usually you say this, like all the time you say this, but then you want to try saying something different. As soon as you understand it really well, then give it a try. Even if you make a mistake doing that thing, it's more because you're kind of nervous as it's a new thing. But uh, you should be getting all of the, uh, like the testing and the practice and all of that by just getting naturally varied review. So just getting all of the input you need, the understandable messages of real vocabulary, and then hearing that in different ways from different people. So remember, you can do this by yourself or you can get someone like me to help you out. All right, if we have... I think that's everybody. Look at that. We made it to the end and just in time. It's time for lunch. Time for me to get some food over here. But thank you very much. Uh, it's always my pleasure to come in and answer these questions for people. Hopefully you're, you're seeing now like, okay, if I can get fluent in one word, then I can probably get fluent in two words and three words and four words. And it just expands from there because you're changing the way you learn. All right. So you're learning more with me like an English speaker rather than learning like uh, make like an English student or whatever. All right. So if you have any questions, you can send us a mail at info at English uh, We're happy to answer questions about like fluent for life. I want to make a new video that explains more of it. But honestly, I don't I'd love to know what what information is missing for people to explain the program. Uh, so if there's something you're like, yeah, what, what does this do or how does it work or something, let me know uh, because I'd love to make like one video that just explains everything and makes it much easier for people to understand because then they can join the program and get fun. All right, well, that's it. Have a fantastic day. Let's see. And I think that's it. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.